these last days. Now, we're still on the seven-year tribulation, and we're still at the middle of the seven-year tribulation, where you see the guillotine, and that's representative of the mark of the beast. And this is my last, or the third and final part of this mini-series called the mark of the beast. Okay? And you can always catch up via YouTube or catch up via podcast. Now, as I've shared many times, the seven-year tribulation is broken into two segments. The last three and a half years is known as the Great Tribulation. Everyone say, Great Tribulation. Great Tribulation. Great Tribulation. Okay? Let's get right into our study. A Bible Believer's Guide to Understanding the Mark of the Beast. This is part three of our teaching. I want to start this morning in the book of Revelations, chapter 13, verses 15 through 17. And we're reading this morning, morning out of the ESV, English Standard Version. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast. Now, again, I've shared before, it's a fascinating study all by itself, that any time you read through Revelations, it refers to the false prophet or the Antichrist. It either calls it a beast or it refers to it as it instead of him. Now, how many of you know when God calls something an it, it normally is an it. And there's a reason he calls it an it because it's not going to be quite human. And we're going to get into that a little bit here this morning. But it, the false prophet, was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is the name of the beast or the number of its name. So the mark itself is the name of the beast, and it's also the number of its name. And we talked about some suggested thoughts about that last week, from Walid and about how uh, when you reverse or invert one of the letters from the Greek, it almost looks like Arabic and almost looks like what they write in place on their forehead and on their forearm, the jihadis, which is in the name of Allah. So pretty, pretty fascinating. And so one of the things I want to recall this morning, again, is that nobody can buy or sell unless he has this mark. Now, can you imagine having money and not being able to go and use it to purchase what you need? Have you ever been in a situation where you went to a grocery store and you loaded up the shopping cart with food and you went to check out and either you couldn't find your credit card and forgotten your purse, didn't have your wallet, or didn't have enough cash in your account? That ever happened to anybody other than me? Please say yes. yes. Oh, thank you. So somebody else has done that other than me. Oh, it's a terrible feeling. Terrible feeling. And these folks, they can't buy or sell anything if they're going to be a believer in Jesus and if they're going to stay true to him because they have not received the mark. Now, this is one of those things where I want to talk to you this morning about the consequences of taking the mark of the beast, the mark of the Antichrist. You know, how many of you know a lot of times we believers justify our actions? And what I mean by that is we justify what we do because we know God's a loving God. Sometimes we take advantage of that fact. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, we might justify our mind. Well, you know, if I, you know, do such and such, even though I know it's wrong, God will forgive me. How many of you know people do that all the time? Listen to me, this is not one of those things that people can do that with. They can't say, well, you know, if I get the mark, God's just going to love me and forgive me anyway. Uh-uh. This is so serious of such divine consequence that once you get the mark, that's it. There is no repentance. Zero. Zilch. Everybody say zero. 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 Now, how many of you ever read those Left Behind books? by Dr. Uh, Tim LaHaye. I love Tim. I really do. I love the books. I've got the entire series in my library, and I've read every one of them at least twice. But this is the thing. In there, he has it where people set up a fake mark. 
Okay, and same thing with those Left Behind movies. Listen to me, there is no faking. It's a sign, an active sign of worship. And you lose the whole point of what's transpiring in Revelation if you take the mark. What's the difference if you take the mark of the beast if you put it on yourself or you go to some center and have it put on? There is no difference. And there are eternal consequences beyond belief for those who take the mark. And this is the only time in Scripture that you find sin that cannot be repented of outside of the sin of blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is defined as calling the work of God the work of Satan, or calling the miracles of God as if Satan himself performed them. Okay? And to give you an example of that, I'm off my notes here, but to give you an example of that, it's very simple. Some of the Jewish leadership had told Jesus he was casting out demons by the hand of the chief or prince of demons. And Jesus is like, that's the most ridiculous thing in the world because the house divided against itself cannot stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, how then can his kingdom stand? And then he looked to them and turned to them and said this, Every sin shall be forgiven of men except for the sin of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, which is attributing the work of God to the work of Satan. All right, so let's take a peek this morning. What are the consequences of taking either the mark or worshiping its image? Revelation chapter 9, verses 1 through 6. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star falling from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. Now, listen to me for a minute. Some speculate and think that these aren't just things taking place in the heavenlies. How many of you know that we don't always, we can't see into the dimension where the spiritual warfare takes place right now? You follow me? There's like a thin veil that separates what we see from this extra dimension where the Spirit of God, the angels of God, fight against the demonic entities, against the principalities and the rulers and the powers of this earth. But during this time period here, this may be something that the whole earth sees, a star like an asteroid or a meteor or something of that nature fall from heaven to earth. And literally, it says he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. And some say that the star, as it hits the earth, if it hits hard enough, would literally make a shaft into the earth. And out of that shaft, look in verse 2, he opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke, like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from the shaft. Now, isn't that what would occur after something had hit the earth? It would create the shaft, and smoke, and dust, and everything else would billow into the atmosphere, literally blotting out the moon and the sun. Now, verse 3 of Revelation 9. Then from the smoke came locusts on the earth, and they were given power like the power of scorpions of the earth. How many of you have ever seen locusts before? Yep. They're up in the tree. They're noisy little things. They make a lot of noise, don't they? They are loud. But these locusts, these aren't like the locusts that are on the planet right now. These are locusts that come out of that shaft. Now, for one, I believe the scripture 100%, and I believe that these really are locusts. Some say, well, they're not locusts, they're helicopters, and they're this and that. And, and God bless them. And again, you know, Hal Lindsey, he's written a lot more books and made a lot more money and is much more famous than I am. But his uh, book from the 80s, The Late Great Planet Earth, you know, he goes into it and, and he thinks a lot of this is analogies. I, for one, used to think that as a new believer, but the closer we get to these end times, and as I see these bizarre things taking place all over the planet, I'm telling you, I think that not anymore. I think when it says that these creatures, these critters come up, East Texas we'd say critters, <laughs> these locust-looking, scorpion-like critters come up out of the smoke, out of the earth, and their sting is like a scorpion. I think they're real supernatural creatures. And verse 4, they were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or any tree. Now, what do locusts normally devour, guys? Plants, green trees, green plants. So these 
locust creatures are not interested in that. Who are they going to hurt? But only those people who do not have the seal of God, where? On their forehead. Wow. Now, this is fascinating. Uh, the 144,000 Jewish evangelists, if you recall, they have the name of God, the seal of God on their forehead. God's name is written across their forehead, and also the name of Messiah is written on their forehead. That's what it says in the scripture in Revelation. So those who are not sealed with the seal of God on their forehead, that's who these creatures are going to be going after. Verse 5, they were allowed to torment them for how many months? Five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. Has anyone here ever been stung with a scorpion sting? Wow. Raise your hand. Let me see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven of eight. Eight of y'all been stung with scorpions? Man, do we live in Texas or what? <laughs> How many of you remember what it felt like? I've never been stung with a scorpion. What did it feel like, Kathy? It feels like somebody driving a nail through your foot. Feel like somebody driving a nail in your foot. So excruciatingly painful. Is that a good description? Yeah. Okay. Wow. I, had, I, I was thinking, when I asked that this morning, probably nobody's going to raise their hand. <laughs> now, we've seen them back in East Texas in our bathtub. There was like these baby, I don't know why they get into the bathtub, baby scorpions. Uh, several times in my wife is the great scorpion hunter. Matter of fact, she's the great bug hunter at my house. If there is a bug, a snake, or a mouse, or anything of that nature, we call mom. Because she and I would go home for our life. So, uh, thank you, honey, for all the scorpions you've scooped up over the years. So here, they were allowed to torment them, verse 5, for five months, but not to kill them. So they didn't kill these people, and their torment was like the torment of a scorpion. Great description. It felt like a nail being driven in. Okay, so picture that when it stings someone. And last verse, verse 6. And in those days, now listen to me, guys. This is one of the strangest, most bizarre scriptures anywhere in the Bible. This is one of those scriptures that you can just sit on and chew on and chew on and chew on. I've looked it up in Greek. I've looked up every word that you could imagine in this verse. In those days, people will seek death. And will not what? Find it. Will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. Now, how weird is that? These people are going to want, they're going to be in such agony, they're going to want to kill themselves, want to die literally, physically, will be unable to. Now, whoever in the Greek, fugo literally means to flee away or vanish. So when it says death will flee from them, Death will fuego literally means will flee away or vanish. They'll be unable to die during this time period. Now, might the mark of the beast produce some physical change to the human? There are some out there who speculate that the mark of the beast is not just a mark, but it literally could possibly change the physical DNA of the human being to make it something to where the human is no longer God's creation, but becomes something else. If that were the case, that might explain why people who receive the mark have no opportunity for repentance whatsoever. No opportunity, zero, zilch. Their fate is sealed because they're no longer totally human. Are you following me? Now you say, well, what basis do they base that on? Well, they base that on Genesis chapter six where it talks about the sons of God, the angels of God, coming during that time period and taking upon themselves the daughters of human beings. And the two, uh, uh, they had sexual, these fallen angels had sexual relationships with these human women and produced a new race of beings. And those race of beings, the Bible calls them Nephilim, okay, or Raphim in Hebrew. And the Nephilim became men of renown. Uh, the Greek gods of Zeus and Apollo and all these other guys uh, who were huge giants and of mighty intellect. Uh, these men of renown, the scripture says, were Nephilim. These were the Nephilim. These uh, cities that the History Channel keeps trying to convince were ancient aliens that visited the planet. Uh, they were not aliens in that sense. They were 
uh, not human. They were a mixture of human uh, DNA and angelic DNA because they had physical children. Matter of fact, the Israelites destroyed the last of them. Some of the uh, Amalekites, some of the Canaanites, uh, when they went into the land of Canaan, remember I shared before that the Israelites said that we were as uh, grasshoppers in their eyes because they were men of great stature, very tall men. And uh, <clears throat> the Smithsonian, they say, has done everything they can to hide the fact of the, uh, 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 the Israelim uh, were ever here. But anyway, this is a fascinating take on it. So, could it be, again, just speculation, but something to think about, it's fascinating. Could it be when these people receive the mark of the Antichrist, that it's more than just worship, but that he promises them some sort of physical change that will transpire in their life, and that physical change keeps them from physically dying at that time because of the <coughs> scorpion locust creature that's stinging them and biting on them, they'll want to die, but will be unable to die. Does he promise them a type of eternal life? I don't know. It's speculation, but it is fascinating. All I do know is the scripture very definitively says that they will long to die, but they will be unable to die during that time. Now, eventually they're going to die because eventually God's going to cast them into the lake of fire. Some believe we said that the mark of the beast will literally change and rewrite the human DNA so they are no longer completely human. Some speculate that the Nephilim, which is the combination of fallen angels with humans, will be promised to those who receive the mark a sort of promise of eternal life. And of course, the devil is a liar and the father of all what? Wow. The father of all lies. And he counterfeits. And that's why the Bible specifically warns again and again and again. Matter of fact, you know, it's amazing how much biblical space in the scripture is taken up that is referencing this seven-year period of time. It's amazing. And you know what that shows me? It shows me God's love. More than anything else, he wants man to repent. And they will not say, you didn't warn me. Right. <clears throat> Revelation 16, 2. So the first angel went poured out his bowl on the earth, and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. So the first consequence, you get the mark, you got these creatures that are coming out of the earth from this dark shaft with smoke coming out that sting you like scorpions, and you, they hurt so bad, like nails being driven into you, you'll want to die and be unable to die. The second thing that happens is if you've received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image, harmful and painful sores come upon you. How many of you have ever had a harmful or painful sore? How about a canker sore in your mouth? That's just a little sore and that's annoying. Can you imagine your whole body being covered with sores? You see, I don't think it's just some little sore, some little spot. I think it's going to be some all-consuming. And you know, some say, again, speculate, that those sores, again, could be a, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Huh? Side effect. A side effect of the DNA change. But all we know that it's part of the judgment of God, and if you get the mark of the beast, you're going to have these harmful and painful sores. And I looked up the word harmful and painful in the Greek, and it's talking about literally grievous. I mean, I was going to, I'll be honest with you, I was going to show you a picture of somebody with sores, but it was so gross, and we're having a nice harvest luncheon, so I'm going to just stick to words, okay, to give you the idea this morning. Someone say thank you, Pastor. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Y'all were loud on that one. <laughs> Revelation 14, 9 and 11. And another angel, a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or in his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So the first angel, he pours it out, and if you receive the mark of the beast, you have these harmful, painful sores. 
The third angel now is going throughout the earth. Now, how many of you know things are really bad if God has to rely on the angels to preach the gospel? And this third angel, he's telling everybody, look, follow them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath poured full strength into the cup of his anger. He will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. That is serious stuff. So this angel is flying throughout the earth proclaiming this warning. And people in the hardness of their hearts still don't listen. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. You know, sometimes, guys, I'm telling you, it makes me so thankful because I am so convinced that faith in Jesus is a gift from Jesus himself. Amen. Can't explain it. I didn't choose him. He chose me. I believe in him because he allowed me to believe in him. Now, I know that doesn't always line up right with our doctrine. I just am convinced that it is a gift from God. Because there are people out there you can raise from the dead and appear to them and they still refuse to believe Revelation 14, 9 through 11, this is verse 11. And the smoke of their torment, whose torment? Torment. This is the torment of those who receive the mark of the beast. Remember, they're thrown into the lake of fire. The smoke of their torment goes up, how long? Forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night. Now, that's a scary picture, isn't it? Yeah. These worshipers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. How many of you think God's not playing around? Amen. The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day or night. Now, how long is forever, guys? Forever. Now, listen to me. Our finite brains, our human brains, cannot even begin to wrap around the concept of eternity of something that goes on forever and ever. But with God, there is no time because there is no death. Amen? Amen. These folks are in agony. See, you have to understand, we as human beings were created to live forever. And every human being is going to be resurrected. Some unto righteousness and unto life. Some unto judgment and unto what's called in the scripture a second death, which is the lake of fire. And young people, I want you to hear me. The choices and decisions and old people that we make affects our eternity. We should have the fear of God so strong in our heart that we just, Lord, you know, I don't feel like you're God with a baseball bat, but I just have so much respect and reverence for you that I'm going to do everything I can to obey you and be one with you. Amen? Because, listen, so many times we sell our birthright for a bowl of beans. Yep. And in our generation, in this culture, guys, people changing spouses the way you change a pair of dirty socks. And, you know, believers, we just, we kind of take the word of God more seriously. Amen? Amen. We just do. Three angels get involved in war warning humanity. The first angel proclaims the everlasting good news. Now, <clears throat> There was a time uh, I was talking about this, I think with David, and we were talking about this. Anytime an angel gets involved in sharing the good news of Jesus, you know that bad things are happening on the planet. Amen? Because he's always used human beings. He's always used people. Amen? To share the gospel. So the angel, during the second half of the tribulation, when the mark of the beast is going on, the first angel goes about, the scripture says, proclaiming the everlasting good news. The second angel cries out against Babylon, and that's a whole nother teaching. The second angel cries out against Babylon, and Babylon is destroyed. And the third angel warns humanity not to take the mark or to worship the beast. All these angels are speaking to people, speaking to people, warning the nations not to take the mark of the beast. <clears throat> Sorry, duplicate. Oh, there we go. The angels going forth proclaim. Now, how that's going to look, I have no idea. All I know is you're going to be able to hear them, and whatever language 
Somebody's in whatever nation, they'll hear that in their own language, in their own nation, in their own natural tongue. Why did I make so many of those slides? Sorry about that. Revelation 15, finally, 2 through 4. You didn't do that as a joke, did you, Josh? Okay. Darn, it would have been funny. <laughs> then I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire. Now, I love these scriptures here because this is some good news here. These are the folks who overcome, who don't take the mark of the beast. I love this. Out of the whole teaching on the mark of the beast, this gets me excited. Then I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire. I also saw those who had won the victory over the beast and its image and over the one whose name is represented by a number. How did they get the victory? How in the world can you get the victory over the Antichrist? How in the world can you get the victory over the mark of the beast? How in the world can you get the victory over sin? How in the world can you get the victory over the things in your life that are coming against you? The same way these folks did by not giving in to it. Everybody say not giving in. Not giving in to it. These folks that we're fixing a rebound absolutely refused to receive the mark. And even though they paid with their life, our life, as I said, is a vapor of what? Smoke, here for a moment and gone. Eternity says, hey, guys, you got the victory. Who wins in the long run, guys? The Antichrist has free reign over this planet for what, seven years? And after that, Jesus comes back and establishes his kingdom. And his kingdom lasts for how many years, y'all? <laughs> for a thousand, and then New Jerusalem comes down, and that lasts forever, amen? amen? So when I saw what looked like a sea of glass mixed with fire, I also saw those who had won the victory over the beast and its image and over the one whose name is represented by a number. They were standing by the sea of glass holding harps that God had given them, and actually that word in Greek is lyres, and singing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. And they were singing, Lord God Almighty, how great and wonderful are your deeds. King of the nations, how right and true are your ways. So these are those who had the victory over the Antichrist by not receiving the mark. And here in this moment, they're caught up in heaven, and they're singing the song of the Lamb before the Lord. Isn't that awesome? In verse 4, part of that song, Who will not stand in awe of you, Lord? Who will refuse to declare your greatness? You alone are holy. All the nations will come and worship you because your just actions are seen by all. And all of the nations will come and will worship him. Amen? Amen. Like it or not, even though the atheists cry out, even though the agnostics, agnostics cry out, even though all the false religions of man cry out, all nations will one day stand before him. Amen. As it is written, every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess to the glory of God the Father that Jesus the Messiah is Lord. Amen? Amen. I tell folks, you're going to do it one day. If you do it now, with faith, you get saved. If you do it in the future, you're going to do it in the future anyway. Amen? Amen. All right, let's all stand to our feet.